Hello. Today I am interviewing John Dedakis for Blackbird Writers Presents, and I am Tracy Phillips. Um, John is an award-winning novelist, a writing coach, and a manuscript editor. He is a former editor at CNN's The Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer. He's also the author of five thriller novels that give a behind-the-scenes look at real-world journalism. He regularly teaches writing workshops and is the host of a video podcast podcast called One to One with John Dedakis. He's originally from La Crosse, La Crosse, Wisconsin, and he now lives with his wife in Baltimore. In his spare time, he's also a jazz musician. <laughs> Please welcome the talented John Dedakis. Hi, Tracy. Hey, how's it going? Very well, thanks. It's so great to talk to you today. Um, I, I love your Lark Tra Chadwick character and the books. Um, and so you're a journalist and that was your original training. And you're now you're drawing on that experience to bring your character Lark to life. So tell us a little bit about your journalism background and the inspiration for Lark. Well, the journalism background goes all the way back to the University of Wisconsin in Madison in the late 60s. And at that time, I was still planning to be a lawyer and to go into practice with my dad. But uh, whenever and, and then I was going to go into politics. And But when I was on, on the way to class every day, this is during the late 60s, the Vietnam War was a big deal. And there was a draft. And so there was a lot of anti-war fervor on the UW campus. And um, I was just, I was bombarded from both the left and the right to take a position for or against the war. And it just felt to me as if the rhetoric on both sides was overheated. And so I felt journalism was a good perch to sit on to try to sort out what the facts are. So I volunteered at a campus radio station, uh, started covering the anti-war movement and the riots, got tear gassed on uh, University Avenue by Charter Street. And um, my parents heard my heard me getting tear gassed in uh, the radio report I filed. And they suggested that I transfer schools and go to go to UW Lacrosse, which I did. But um, my grade point average was so bad. I mean, it was like 1.94 that I lost my student deferment and I'd already been in the draft. I mean, I'd, I had a number that was way in the danger area, like 14. So long story short, I enlisted to avoid the draft. I, I went to the uh, uh, defense information school when I was in the army where I learned sort of rudimentary journalism and plot twist. I had orders to Vietnam, but two weeks before I shipped out, my orders were changed to Germany, and I spent the next two and a half years at the headquarters of the American Forces Radio and Television Network in Frankfurt, Germany, doing wow. interviews for a special events radio unit. And the first interview I was assigned to do was with this guy named Alfred Hitchcock. Maybe you've heard of him. <laughs> and and that was a that was the moment because I I was doing something that I knew I could that I loved doing and that I was good at and so that then is what got me into journalism. After I got out of the army, I worked at in radio first in Madison and then went to uh, the NBC affiliate Channel Fifteen in Madison, and um, so I was in broadcast journalism for forty five years. Uh, covered the White House for the last three years of Reagan's administration, and then went to CNN in 1988 in Atlanta as a writer. And uh, and then I ended my career at in journalism at CNN uh, 10 years ago, 2013. I was a copy editor uh, on the, the Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer. So, you know, it was it was quite a ride. And uh, but I got into writing novels because when they made me an editor at CNN, it was tedious. It was fault finding. It paid well, but I needed a creative outlet. And so I started to write my first novel, but it took 10 years to get the agent that I've got. Yeah. Well, that's quite a story. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Cliff's Notes version. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um yeah, I recently finished the fourth book in the series the, called The Bullet in the Chamber. Um, and that one opens with Lark preparing for a press conference at the White House. 
Um, and she's in the, the press briefing room. And right before it, is, it starts, there's an attack. And the president and it is shuffled out of there and everybody runs. And um, this is a fantastic opening Thank you. for a book. <laughs> well, so they say me. you need to hook the reader. Yeah, well, you did. Thank you. <laughs> so tell us, talk a little bit about that. Well, about what? About the, 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 well, I know I'm jumping into book four, but um, yeah. Well, I, I can tell you about book four. Um, this is Lark's first day as a White House correspondent, and she's very nervous. She uh, uh, doesn't know where to go, doesn't know where to sit. She's just figuring it out. She's totally intimidated by this. And um, so she, so while the, just as the president, she knows the president from having covered him uh, as a, as a candidate and he's just been elected. So, you know, he's still pretty popular. And um, as he is beginning to introduce some of the people on his staff, like the, uh, the national security advisor, uh, I think that's the, the topic of that particular news conference or press briefing. Um, the Secret Service dashes in and says, everybody out now. And uh, and so Lark, you know, the president is whisked away. Uh, everybody else is kicked out and they have to there. It's almost like 9-11 where the, you know, the White House was evacuated. They had to leave the compound, run, just run. And that's pretty much what this is all about. And uh, and then there's an explosion in the uh, in the briefing room. Uh, you know, the White House is attacked and uh, Lark is on live radio. Uh, uh, she's working for the Associated Press. And so she they put her on AP radio and she's reporting on what what's going on. So that's that's pretty much how it opens. Yeah. And then, and then we have to figure out, you know, who's behind this. And, you know, there's a subplot and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And it's been so long since I've written it that I've forgotten most of it. <laughs> That's not true. So did you ever work in the White House? I did. I covered the I covered the White House when Reagan was president for his last three years. And um, I mean, I was working for the Christian Broadcasting Network, so I wasn't a backbencher. I was a no bencher. You know, I mean, I I snuck in and sat at a, uh, the Christian Science Monitor seat because that guy never came. So uh, so I was able to 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 sit near the back. But um, yeah, it was it was a great experience. And so I had one of the one of the last things I did was a, a in-depth piece on the White House press corps versus the president. And so I Larry Speaks was uh, Reagan's press secretary at the time. So we followed him around for a day, you know, and so a lot of the stuff that I I use in my novels come from that experience covering the White House. Well, that and that's cool. It seems like it's, you know, you're right there. And um, you know, and I was curious about the details too because um you know the details of the story always bring your reader right into the world and um how do you determine like how much reality to add to your fiction i mean there's some characters that are real people and a lot that are not that are you know fictional but how do you decide well that i mean really i mean that's the um the main question I think every author asks themselves. And, and I think that the danger is the more you know about something, the more you're tempted to dump all of those details in there uh, just, just to, because you know so much. And the, but that's not what the story is. And right. so you have to make that distinction. You know, does this put the person in the room or does it just make them in the room and make them go to sleep because nothing's <laughs> happening? And so that's the balancing act. It's like you need to have the reader give the reader a sense that they're there, but you also have to keep in mind what's the story and the story is king. And so that is what, what drives everything and what determines what stays and what's and what goes. Yeah. And and so the attack turns out to be from drones. Um, did you have to do a lot of research about that? You know, I did. And um, um, <clears throat> that's not to say that, 
you know, everything in there is, is meant to be accurate. I mean, there are some things that I, I just made up because, you know, drone technology is, I mean, they're, they're always innovating. And so uh, it's not really meant to be a how to about, you know, uh, building a drone or flying as a drone or anything like right. that. You know, the drone is just basically a catalyst, you know, that moves the story along and it gives it sort of a bigger backdrop for uh, for the dynamics of the story. But I did do a lot of research. And at the time, uh, this would this would have been back in 2013, 2014, that I was writing it, where, you know, the U.S. still needed a policy the, the FAA was still developing a policy about private drones. And so um, I wanted to incorporate some of that um, policy stuff into that particular book. You know, some of that drone stuff is probably outdated now, and some yeah. of it was probably ahead of its time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's um, a, kind of an interesting topic. And whenever you can like bring in like technology or whatever, that's, it makes it, I don't know, very interesting to me anyway. <laughs> well, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so now we've also heard all the cliches about, you know, writers writing what they know, or we write our experiences and, um, or we write to heal. Um so in this story, you do draw from some personal experiences that were, um, I imagine, very emotional for you. Um, Lark's boyfriend is a heroin addict, and um, and your son died from heroin addiction, right? That's right, right. And I was at the time, I was, um, I was when when let's see, this goes back to 2011, when my son, 22 years old, youngest son, Stephen. Uh, went missing. And it was out of character for him. Uh, he was a responsible kid, a funny guy. And um, he just went off the grid. Um, <clears throat> and he was missing for a week. Um, long story short, he was found dead in my car about a block and a half away from where we lived in DC. And it was a heroin overdose, an accidental heroin overdose. And so I actually started making notes for trouble, uh, bullet in the tr chamber, uh, probably two days after he went missing, because I knew heroin was probably going to be a factor. And because um, he had revealed to me that he was using and we were, you know, working together on trying to uh, turn it around. And so I, but I was still writing Troubled Water, which is my third novel, but while I was working on Troubled Water, I started writing Bullet in the Chamber just to, because I wanted to be able to access some of that stuff while it was still emotionally raw. And I only wrote about six chapters before I hit the wall. It was just too, it was too painful. Yeah. And and I, and I gave it up for probably four years before I returned to writing the novel. Yeah. And and so I used a lot of what was going on with Stephen as a subplot in Lark's relationship with her boyfriend, uh, because I already had these existing characters and I was able to take Stephen's stuff and put it in, you know, to deepen the characters that I already had. And it was a catharsis. It was it was definitely hard to write. I was going through grief counseling at the time. I think I probably cried the whole time I wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll still cry when I look at some of those chapters. My wife has never read it and that's okay because, you know, everybody grieves differently. Yeah. Um, but it was <clears throat> definitely a catharsis and, and it's one of the things that I encourage when I, when I teach writing, um, we live in a society that anesthetizes the pain yeah. and writers, I think, uh, have a lot of pain in their lives because you write what you know. It's it's part of the human condition. But I believe that if you can move toward the pain and mine it, then that will add authenticity and power to whatever story that you write. And it'll be it'll be therapeutic, I think, as well. Yeah. Um and so like in what ways was it healing for you to Right, oh, that's that's a good question. I think it was healing. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that question before, so I'm making it up as I go. But the I think the answer it was healing for me because I was able to articulate and relive some of those experiences. Um, and and I think that 
one of the things I discovered is that when you talk to someone about writing a novel, you know, people say, well, what's it about? And you start telling them it doesn't take doesn't take long before someone that you're talking to says, you know, my son is going through this or I'm in recovery or whatever. You know, the it, it, it in in a sense, it's healing because it it allowed other connections to happen. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it destigmatizes whatever it is you're writing about. My first book, uh, Fast Track, talks about suicide, which is what happened to my my sister. And, um, you know, suicide, addiction, those are tremendously stigmatized issues. And yet, how are we going to be able to get through it and beyond it and heal if we don't uh, uh, help each other? And have the and, conversation. Yeah. And have the conversation and get it yeah. out there. So... Being able to articulate it, I think, was probably the fundamental uh, element of healing. Yeah. And I think having that connection, then it's kind of a universal theme in a lot of ways, then yeah. connecting with others, too. Then you, you're helping bring healing to readers as well, I believe. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you really think about it, if you analyze any conversation that you have, look at how superficial they can be. We are masters at being able to, you know, ride the surface, uh, waves. ride the surface, <laughs> because we don't want to impose on someone else. We don't want to make them uncomfortable. And yet, I teach a class on interviewing, and you know, whenever you dig a little deeper, you know, that's when the real connections can start to happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, completely agree. Um, so you teach, you're a writing coach as well. Um, and one of your classes is from journalist to novelist or how I learned to start making it up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Talk about writing the surface waves. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, what was that transition like for you um, from, you know, writing the facts to moving into fiction? It, it's not easy. I mean, a lot of people think that journalists make it up, you know, and unlike what some presidents will tell you, it right. is a firing offense at a reputable news organization to make things up. Mm -hmm. And so that is just drummed into you right from the very beginning that you do not do that. Accuracy is job one. And um, so actually, I didn't just make a, an, an easy transition. I actually started re researching a biography of a friend of mine who was murdered in Georgia and so my transition to writing books was really writing nonfiction, but I ran into a lot of problems with it. It was expensive. I was digging up uh, information about him that his parent, that his family didn't know about. And so, you know, for any number of reasons, I backed off from that and took a lot of the research and poured it into the first novel that I wrote. Hmm. And so the, at the very beginning, you're still kind of going, well, these are the facts. But at, at some point, you can you realize that you can actually start making it up and have fun doing that and using your imagination. Um, because the the often the truth and the facts aren't nearly as compelling as if you can embellish and make it more engaging. And so once I once I gave myself permission to do that in my fiction writing, then uh, I never looked back. I mean, I it never it never sloshed back into my copy on uh, on CNN, unlike what some people will probably say it is the case. But uh, uh, it uh, it really opened the door then, so that by the time I left CNN. I had three novels out and basically a second career as a writing coach and, and teacher. Yeah, that's amazing. That's uh, and inspirational because I, I know journalists who are, you know, now beginning to go through the same process. And um, and and I hear it's really difficult to, to go from that fact writing mentality to um, make the shift. It yeah. it really it really can be it it yeah. although I've heard also that journalists are excellent novelists because they they're detail oriented and because of the relationships that they've forged over the years. Right, I mean, that makes sense to me too. Um, what's the most common question you get from writers? Ooh, that depends on where they are in the process. Um, 
it, as far as craft is concerned, one one question that keeps coming up is: Should I write in first person or third person? And and interestingly, that can lead to writer's block right out of the gate. Huh. And and I mean, writer's block is fear. It's fear of making a mistake, fear of not being perfect. And so, if your very first question is first person, third person, you haven't even written a word yet, and already the straitjacket is on and you're paralyzed. Right. And so my advice is if you've never written a novel before, write it first person, write the first draft first person, because that's your comfort zone. Yeah. That's how you communicate already. And, you know, maybe the story should be told third person. You'll find that out as you go. So in the rewrite, you can change it because as a, as a manuscript editor, a lot of times the novels that I read, uh, from rookie writers, they're third person, and that's not their comfort zone. And they and it just feels clunky because they're not. That's not the way they easily communicate. Yeah, um, and then and then probably uh, the other question that I get is, how do you get an agent? <laughs> it's uh, hard. It is. It's very hard. But I mean, getting published is not because self publishing is now so <clears throat> easily available. But uh, I encourage people to try to go the traditional getting an agent route, because uh, once you do that, that'll bring your writing to a professional level so yeah. that no matter what avenue you use, uh, your writing will be much better than if you just right. impatiently well, tried to get it out there. Right. Because you've got somebody who's on your side, who's on, you know, team author to try and help you get your writing up to that level. Exactly. Well, and that's that's why Blackbird Writers and and what you're involved in and you founded is so great because it's a it's an organization that encourages other writers and uh, you know that seems to be your personal gift. <laughs> well, I hope so. Um, I, I mean, I like helping out people, you know, and and um, it just it seemed like a natural fit to me because when I first got published. Um, I, I realized, how do you do this alone? Yeah. How does any one author do this alone? And you're, we have to do all this marketing and all this other, and get yourself out there. And I was like, wouldn't it be great if. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Because, because writing is such a solitary experience. Right. Exactly. Um, so what are your biggest fears, if any, about writing? <laughs> You know, that's, that's the $64,000 question. And I'll, I'll be honest, I think the fear is, I don't have anything to say. Um, the fear is that if I do say something, I'm going to come across as stupid. You know, it's just like, either it's like, well, duh. Uh, and so uh, I guess that's probably the the, the biggest impediment uh, that I have to keep struggling with is that uh, I'm not good enough, don't have anything really to say. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, and I, and I don't think I'm alone. I think that most writers are their own worst enemy. Oh yeah. No, I agree with you there. And, and the other one that, that always gets me is, well, this has been written about so many times, right? You know, right. how many more, you know, do they really need to hear my point of view about that? Yeah, Exactly. And and We're the answer the is yes, yeah. they do. <laughs> okay, you think so? All right. Yes, fine. because everyone comes from a different place. We've gone through different, you know, experiences. True. So, I feel like everybody has an important, um, you know, perspective on what whatever we're doing. So, well, I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what has been the biggest source of inspiration for you this year? And what are you writing now? Well, I, uh, my, uh, agent has just accepted my manuscript for my sixth novel and, uh, uh, just signed the contract with, uh, speaking volumes publishing and, uh, my novel enemies domestic will be published in the, uh, summer of 2024. It's a political thriller just in time for the 2024 presidential election. Oh boy. And the the it, it starts with now Lark, it's Lark Chadwick, I write as a woman. And in this particular book, uh, she's pregnant. It's her first day on the job as White House press secretary. 
her first the first question that she's asked on live television from a Tucker Carlson type is are you or are you not planning to abort your unborn child so i'm dealing with abortion qanon white christian nationalism and mental illness uh as we wow. i mean i don't even have to make this stuff up it's it <laughs> i mean i'm quoting trump without even having to name trump um and it's it's you know it's it's at a time when our country is teetering between are we going to be a democracy are we going to stay being a democracy or are we going to be an authoritarian regime you know run by a dictator um and and the stakes could not be higher so i i had to really make sure that i got it done in time you know to get it out there so my inspiration has been the dystopia of what we've been living through the last six years. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And you don't tread lightly there, do you? You just like took it all on. <laughs> I took, I took it all on and I'm going to piss off half the country probably, <laughs> although I, I still have my journalism chops. I mean, I, you know, even though I'm dealing with abortion, I, I really want people, no matter where you are uh, on the spectrum in terms of, you know, what your beliefs are to feel that you're, uh, position is fairly articulated, uh, you know, and and uh, because it is a very fraught and personal issue, and I don't think that there are any easy answers. And I mean, I'm a guy, so I don't even have to worry about whether or not I'm going to have an abortion. But um, you know, my wife and I, uh, uh, my wife has been my beta reader. Like every every chapter I wrote, we talked about it. She came up with some really helpful insights. And we had some great discussions. So uh, I've got you know several female beta readers who weighed in, and uh, so I, I I feel that I've covered the bases, but it's it's going to be a tough one. It's a it's it's where we're going if we don't wake up. Yeah. Well, I look forward to reading that <laughs> and, um, and we will be watching your website for when the news hits, when okay. your book comes out, All right. um, where, uh, can readers find your books and where um, can they find you? Well, the probably the best way to do it is through my website and that's, it's my name.com. So that's J O H N D as in dog E D as in dog A. K I S as in Sam.com, John Dedakis.com. It's got my thumbnails of the books, links to wherever you can get them. Uh, a con it's got a contact portal. So if you want to send me an email, you can do it through there too. Great. And what about social media? I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, I'm I'm on Twitter, which is now X, but I'm not real uh, a fan of that particularly. So um, Facebook is probably the one I use the most, followed by LinkedIn. There's Authors Den too, where a lot of my writing is posted. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, you can find me out there. Okay. Well, thanks so much. It has been a great conversation. Thank I've you. really enjoyed talking with you, John. Well, I'm glad we, you and I met in, uh, in Minneapolis at what BoucherCon was it? And, yep. uh, and, uh, you've been a, a tremendous support and encouragement to me. So thank you. I really enjoyed our time together, Tracy. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see you around. Okay. <laughs>